Okay. And you can see the screen, right? Yes, yes, yes. You can put it. Yeah, that's in the slideshow mode now. Okay. How are things, uh, Sadakar? I mean, uh, okay, a little better. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, people are uh, predicting the third wave uh, with that. I think uh, the state government is putting a lot of pressure to uh, be ready for the third wave and uh, make all the, particularly with the pediatric wards. So that has yeah. become a that has become a big challenge now because um, the pediatric wards are always overfilled uh, with the patients, regular patients. Now it's very yeah. difficult to earmark the, the beds for the COVID, number one. Number two, to get the trained staff, there are not enough trained staff to deal with the pediatric uh, population. Uh, yeah. The other problem here is that okay. we never uh, send these uh, nurses for uh, better training, like, you know, uh, the pediatric intensive care and all. Uh, two aspects. One is there is no mechanism in the government. Even if there are some avenues, the sisters here are not very, uh, they're not very keen because there are no incentives. If somebody goes for an ex uh, additional training and gets into the pediatric ICU, they'll be viewed with uh, the weird, just like any other uh, nurses here. So that's a, that has not been developed over years. So now it's difficult to find the sisters working for children. Yeah. You think there will be uh, kids? Uh, that's your concern. We're not sure yeah. if they will, right? Uh, yeah, that's what uh, the predictions are. That's what the epidemiologists are saying. Yeah. We, in our second wave, we saw some children, but uh, it's not that much uh, to, um, to worry about. But we got, maybe we'll send Kairam back. Yeah, he's a pediatrician. Yeah. yeah, I'm on my way. <laughs> but but I should I go to KGH or one of the private hospitals? Sudhakar, yeah. I don't mean to be uh, bad, but remember at the peak of the mucormycosis, mm -hmm. if there were five or six private hospitals with uh, operating theaters and ENT surgeons, in the most acute situation, when we were not able to operate on those cases in KGH, they could have been given to the private hospitals. Were there some cases being operated on in the private hospitals by private ENT surgeons? Yes, the reason there are. I'm asking, the reason I'm yeah. asking that, should we also prepare for pediatric explosion? If they all came to KGH, would you make deals with private pediatric ICUs? Yeah, uh, the situation in the private pediatric ICs is also similar. Most of these uh, hospitals, there are very few exclusive pediatric hospitals. Wherever they have some designated beds for the pediatrics, they're almost always full. Uh, the situation is no different from what you have in KGH. So to get extra space, extra beds, extra pediatricians is something very difficult. Yeah. Well, there could be trouble. Yeah, you, you heard um, Sunil the other day, Sunil Kishore. Yes, yes. Yeah, he has some, maybe some 40 bedded uh, pediatric ward and pediatric ICU put together. And uh, it's pretty much uh, full al always. Um, very difficult to find uh, the kind of uh, dedicated pediatrician to deal with um, COVID cases because they have even otherwise other patients like with the diarrhea and other problems. Yeah.
Do you, you have enough uh, pediatric clinics that can see most of them don't need to be admitted? Yeah, uh, you have an adequate number of pediatricians. I think there'll be around 100 pediatricians in the city. I think it could be okay. Good morning, Ramon Garu. Uh, good morning, Sridhar. Good morning, Sudhar. Good morning, yeah, good morning, good morning. Madras Garu. You were last but one now, the regular daily series, Sudhakar Garu? No, no, whatever uh, Dr. Kairam says. Yeah, Uday Kumar Garu, Sridhar Garni, Sridhar Saran Lede. फोर जूनियर इधर సోదాగర్ ప్రసాద్ మీరు క్లాస్ మెంటే కదా ఎస్ 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 ఆ అదే బుజ్జి మర్చిపోతారా మీరు రామోన్ గారు ఆ చెప్పండి నేను సోదాగర్ వాల్ క్లాస్ మెంట్ ప్రసాద్ అని ఎస్పిఎం క్యాంప్ కి వెళ్ళాం ఒక 1 వీక్ 1 వీక్ కదా అంటే సోదాగర్ అది రోజు 10 డేస్ వి స్పెండ్ టుగెదర్ అండ్ అనదర్ వన్ ఆఫ్ మై క్లాస్ మెంట్ సుబ్రాజ్ గారు అండ్ మీరు మన వెంకటేట్ గారు అని మన పిజ్జాజి ప్రొఫెసర్ అండి వారు గుర్తుంది అసిస్టెంట్ सुधाकर अड्डी मैं रोड पक् मत हॉटल तेवन काका हॉटल भोजन तरवा उपमा के मन वेंटेश अगर उपमा की फेमस नक्पल टेपल अनदर अनदर थिंग ई रिमंबर एटे वूपार अला हाउ दे प्रिपेर दिश मन चक् बोमल कदा एटकोपाक एटकोपाक फेमस कदा बोमलैपक्ष अवे उ महेश अवार्ड महेश प्रीवियोल चला and it is very useful to my patients nenu arthropod surgeon ga nen treatment treat cheyin patients evarne ani kan nen other than subject i learned so many things ala i can't explain i have noted down all the points in my diary also evandi seriously ga na daggara ga arthropod surgeon ga evaru ostara covid treatment ki evaru raru kada ma daggara ga ma daggara ma daggara raru kada ha मम्मी फोन फोन सुधाकर बेड इपी सुधाकर रेमडेसीवीर इप्पन फोन अंत अद आधा उपयोगपड़ता मे दट दलजी सर्वीस वी हाव बी डूइंग बेड अरे रेमसीवीर इवे सर्वीस अंत वर्फुल प्लाटा श्रीधर गुजर अंदर for uh, doing a wonderful service where is the sidagar where are you from sir gokulam andi nena ha ma original nena school el in srikakulam okay 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 my parents are from kadapa kani ma father srikakulam lone practice chesu okay okay meeru no gsr murthy classmates ha yeah ma ji murthy nenu classmates yeah okay 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 श्रीधर गुड मार्निंग उदय कुमार 
ఒరిజినల్ ఫోటో మాకు చూపించరా ఎంతసేపు అదేనా ఎప్పుడో సినిమా యాక్టర్ లా ఉన్నారు దీంట్లో మీరు ఇప్పుడు సినిమా యాక్టర్ ఎలా ఉన్నారో మాకు కావాలి కదా సార్ శ్రీధర్ వాళ్ళ ఫాదర్ డాక్టర్ రాజారెడ్డి గారు సార్ అప్పట్లో చాలా రెండు సజ్జన్ మోస్ట్లీ ఒక్కలే సజ్జన్ ఎక్కడ కడప శ్రీకాకుళం రామ్ ప్రసాద్ మీ జూనియర్ మా మా రామ్ ప్రసాద్ తమ్ముడు నేను మీ ఇంటి పక్కన ఉండేవాళ్ళం చిన్నప్పుడు మీ ఇంట్లోనే ఉండేవాళ్ళు క్రికెట్ ప్లేయర్ and i think uh, he is the biggest all rounder in the new york area and i have uh, been fielding in his field i missed a lot of catches but uh, he you have in front of you a covid all rounder so dr chilamuri will talk to you about i sent a sentence today 29000 29 million people got covid in india 356000 people are dead out of the others we will be seeing a lot of people with a lot of complaints how many of those complaints are truly related to covid how many are related to depression how many are related to other things and how to navigate that field is what uh, this all rounder is going to show us thank you sridhar proceed thank Proceed. you Uh, good morning to all of you um today um i, I think in the last several weeks um you focused on what to do with patients um who are acutely ill in the hospital and um, today i'll take the discussion uh, completely away from it uh, and i hope this also will work um because i feel there's a, a an important need on what you do with other things that uh, patients with covid have um in my mo in my own personal opinion as the um, pandemic evolved um in new york city within two weeks it became clear to us that the people who should manage is not sub specialists uh, but primarily people who are general infirmary because the disease manifests with many syndromes um and mostly general practitioners primary care physicians they are probably the best suited people to manage patients from from the point of which uh, i will take uh, the discussion and you will see why they are better capable and as india has more and more people are recovering this and being discharged from the hospital the aspect of care that becomes supremely important is what i'd like to cover today um so with that um slide on moving let me try again I think uh okay we're moving now um so at the point of discussion i'll take i think in the last several weeks uh we had multiple discussions and what we focused there is mostly what happens during the hospitalization i think this is where uh you mostly do uh steroid it's uh, oxygen um, most of them we discussed where people will be hospitalized or we discussed who needs to be hospitalized and uh, we kind of also covered on uh, bad outcomes and what causes bad outcomes uh, like ards things like that so most of that happens in the first uh, from the time of symptom onset um, to about um, um um two to three weeks uh, from the time of onset to maybe four weeks and most patients will get discharged um at this point at four weeks and uh, so what happens after four weeks to up to 90 days and the most important point i want to mention and i won't discuss all the options here i'll just discuss the things that we are not paying that we would, i would hope you would pay more attention to is that from the fourth week to the 12th week is need 
nearly a 30% mortality rate. So this is often not discussed. And you may have seen this happen in your own practice, that many patients are discharged from the hospital after doing well, be it from a ward or from critical care or a step-down unit. And within a few days after they discharge home, they collapse and they die. So this is a story that happened uh, in our own experience. Uh, as I talk to people in India, it happens all the time in India too. Uh, so we are not paying enough attention to what happens to COVID patients from week four uh, to week 12. And so I'm really discussing uh, acute post-COVID, not the long post-COVID syndromes and the persistent syndromes, which we could discuss at some other point. But I think India, as it moves, as your numbers start dropping, you will have more and more patients that will be discharged out of the hospital and things begin to go wrong or coming back to hospitals or they'll get admitted, things like that. So that's the group of uh, symptoms that I want to discuss about. Um, as you already know, um, this is nothing new, um, that uh, COVID uh, involves many systems, the heart, the GI, the liver, the skin, endocrine, uh, kidney, thromboembolism, and neurological uh, manifestation. I think you've spent a lot of time on uh, what happens to the pulmonary part, uh, which we discussed. And I think you covered enough about the thromboembolism and the use of anticoagulants and, and whatnot. But I'll argue with you that, that the pneumonia, the respiratory disease, and the thromboembolic disease are primarily the first four weeks. That, that's all you will see it. And what you see after that, you really don't have to worry about thromboembolism. So two, three days ago, we discussed uh, how long to give anticoagulants upon discharge and what happens. And as uh, we went on back and forth on it, but I just want to show you data that, and it's our own experience, that after you discharge a patient from the hospital, or even uh, if you never admit it, but they have mild to moderate disease, whatever uh, thromboembolism happens, most of it happens in the first four weeks and not beyond. So if you have patients who are going home after discharge and within a week or 10 days later, they completely collapse and die, um, it's often people think that this is, they may have had a massive PE or a massive uh, uh, DVT or something causing that death. And it, it isn't so. We think a majority of people die after discharge because they have a uh, serious heart disease that had, ha, has been underestimated. So I'll go through that and a bit about the stroke and don't forget uh, management of diabetes, both in the inpatient and later on. So that's what I wanna cover. And to prove that point, so here's a study. This is a prospective study where they took a, a, I think approximately 160 patients in, in Denmark and followed them up to 90 days after discharge. And they would regularly look for signs and symptoms of uh, either venous thromboembolism or DVT or pulmonary embolism. And these were all confirmed uh, with the imaging study. They either did a CT scan or did a Doppler to show if the patient really had uh, embolism or not. So this is not presumptive PE. This is not symptomatic PE. This is actually image confirmed PE. So 90 days after you were discharged from the hospital, 2.6% of patients actually had DVT. So most of whatever happens, happens in the first four weeks. So any patient, whether it's COVID or non-COVID, who's admitted to the hospital, especially to the ICU, 2.6 is the rate that you would see anyway. So COVID doesn't necessarily, after the, you finish your four weeks, does not substantially increase your chances of having DVTs or PEs. So something else is killing these patients. And here it is, um, a little more detail from the same study. So if you can see, most of the mortality happens in the first four weeks. After that, there's very little increase in mortality after the discharge. And if the patient is integrated severely ill, obviously there's a higher death rate in them, we know that. And if they're only getting supplemental oxygen, many, very few of them really get pulmonary embolism or DVT and die from it. And therefore they continue to have a very low risk. On the other hand, if you actually choose to treat them, the risk of bleeding is not minor. So the 4.6% of patients who were given anticoagulants they're actually developing 
um, either a significant bleed or a minor bleed, but bleeding is fairly common in post-COVID patients. Therefore, if you don't really have a compelling reason to give anticoagulants, I think after you discharge, at the time of discharge, if the patient does not have a proven clot, there's really no, no compelling reason to go on giving them because the rate of DVT is so low in them. So what really is the problem? So the problem for us, I think, we think the biggest reason, and I'll show you our experience, um, is cardiac injury. Uh, we are really underestimating the amount of cardiac injury that patients suffer when they have moderate to severe illness and even patients who have mild illness. Uh, to begin with, this COVID primarily affects patients who already have risk factors, older people, people with hypertension, people with diabetes. So therefore, they're at setup to have cardiac injury. And this, um, this is a study uh, from New York itself and uh, uh, from another hospital, St. Francis where they looked at um, patients um, at the troponin levels and then took uh, the total amount of uh, damage to the um, LV function or right ventricular function. And the higher the troponin levels, the numbers of patients who reach significant amount of damage is up to 67% to 60, um, both right or left ventricle um, injuries. So it is fairly common and often underestimated at the time of discharge. This is our data, which we just presented at the American College of Cardiology. Um, so one of the things that we, we don't hear enough about it is in COVID, we are all, all the time told not to go near patients. So tests are we are done in a limited way. Um, so we really don't have enough insight. So right from the big ring, we sat uh, as a team and said, we can't keep practicing medicine blindly. We need to have insights into disease. So we went ahead and did echocardiograms uh, in patients who had moderate to severe illness. Um, and the, the graphs that are included here are patients who were admitted to ICU. They were severely ill uh, patients. And we did co um, echocardiograms on all of them um, uh, who agreed to have it done. 66 patients agreed to do it during our first wave. And nearly 80% in our series had abnormal um, echocardiograms. And if the echocardiograms, what we were looking for is right ventricular dimension, obviously they get significant amount of pulmonary disease, pulmonary hypertension. Uh, we look for tricuspid velocity and electric ejection fraction. And clearly the lower the ejection fraction, the higher the death rate. Likewise, the right ventricular ventricular systolic pressure, the higher it is, the more the death rate. And then if you follow them out for 90 days or so, so what we did was we took patients uh, who were sick uh, and then discharged after that. And then we went on to do repeat echoes on them uh, at the point of 90 days and started looking to see what happens to them. So what we saw, um, we, are, we don't have a lot of patients where we repeated the echo. So the, but the take home point is when patients are admitted in the hospital and they have moderate to severe illness, a substantial number of them will get heart disease. Their LV function goes down. It's probably maybe because of um, uh, patients having um, uh, either ischemic events, myocarditis, or a combination of both, which is causing them, or right ventricular failure because of a tremendous increase in pulmonary hypertension. And then what we saw 90 days later was 30% of patients, they actually got better. 30% of patients didn't change. And 30% of them actually got worse 90 days later. And a fair number of these patients, up to 40% of them, got readmitted. By the way, many patients who are admitted to critical care units um, tend to get readmitted and many of them die. So that's the reason why the first 90 days after discharge you still have a 30% mortality rate in these patients. Obviously, these are patients with multiple risk factors and you can expect them to continue to have death rates uh, in them. So even though they at that point will be COVID negative, but the sequelae of the initial infection will lead to uh, bad outcomes further down the line. And in the patients with the 30% who actually got worse, what we saw was um, the initial phases, 
a percentage of them were myocarditis, the others were ischemia, and the 30% who actually got worse actually had ischemic heart disease. So they end up with tremendous amount of endothelial um, in, um, activation during the COVID state. And then two major risk factors that many of them have, or, or three if you say, older age, um, elevation in uh, uh, blood glucose and blood pressure is the third risk factor, leads them to develop aggressive ischemic disease in the 90 days after. Many of them probably had underlying ischemic heart disease and that we never really knew it until uh, they came to the hospital. Um, and some actually had progression of their disease. So I, you know, so why are people dying after discharge? I would argue a large number of them may be dying because their heart disease has not been adequately addressed. So, so in the first four weeks after discharge, I think you primarily have to focus on these syndromes. One is you have to recognize whether the patient had heart failure or not. Now, I, I realize that in India, it's not easy to get echo, especially the healthcare system under so much of stress. It is not easy for you to get uh, echocardiograms. But nevertheless, um, since uh, you depend on your clinical exam, one of the things you want to focus on time of discharge, is there evidence of congestive heart failure? Or if you were managing patients as an outpatient, four weeks into the disease, you should reevaluate the patient to see if they have heart failure or any evidence of um, diminished either right heart failure or a left heart failure. ECHO would be uh, optimal to do it, but if you don't focus on it because it's fairly common to see them. So if you're seeing uh, bilateral infiltrates, don't assume all of it is because of COVID because substantial number of them at the, at the four weeks and beyond, their lung disease has mostly beginning to get better. So if you're still seeing infiltrates in the lung, it probably is heart failure. And so you need to recognize it and treat it. So for heart failure, we, we still recommend standard therapy, uh, which is guideline directed. So you will give A's, ARBs, Lasix, vasodilators, and if they still continue to need more, maybe even beta blockers and albactone, just like you would treat heart failure in any other patient. The only problem um, if you are managing patients in the rural parts of the country um, is if you're going to use ARBs and uh, ACE inhibitors, you have to worry about renal failure and hyperkalemia in post-COVID syndromes. So at least in them, when you recognize heart failure, Make sure at least you get one BUN creatinine because that will guide you on how much of ACE and ARP that you want to use. And if the renal function is normal, then you don't have to worry about it. Go ahead and use um, whatever you use normally for heart failure. We don't have any particular restrictions on post-COVID patients who have heart failure. So that's what you want to do. And as I said earlier, that those who had heart failure with guideline-directed medical therapy actually got better or stabilized. And those who stabilized and got better did not have to come back to hospital and rarely die. Those who actually got worse obviously need further intervention. Likewise, coronary syndromes are not rare in them because you're looking at people with significant risk factors. So we have no problem giving dual antiplatelet agents. And I'll talk to you about statins. So dual antiplatelet agents are relatively safe to give in patients who, who have COVID uh, four weeks after the initial infections. The only problem comes is when you also have a proven uh, clot in the patient and you require that patient to get uh, anticoagulants at the time of discharge because they either, either have a pulmonary embolism or a mesenteric vein thrombosis or DVT somewhere else. So in them, you may end up having to use three drugs. So you, you now have a patient who may need um, dual antiplatelet agents and anticoagulants. And the reason why you're thinking of dual antiplatelet agents is because they have coronary ischemia, either by EKG or some other way you recognize that they have it. So in those patients, if you give these three drugs, your chance of them developing a bleed is a little higher. So the way we, we've uh, modified our schedule to drop aspirin 
will still give coprodactyl and anticoagulants in them. If they don't need anticoagulants, we will go ahead and give dual and platelet agents, and they've done quite well. We haven't seen any adverse events using them. Now, in terms of statins, that in the beginning of the pandemic, um, there was a belief that statins actually induce ACE receptors, they upregulate ACE receptors, and therefore there was some concern whether we should use statins in acute COVID. Um, that has no longer been the case. So, so what we do is if you have clear risk factors uh, that require statin therapy, because you either have a coronary syndrome and ischemic heart disease, you have hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and, and diabetes, particularly you are focused on lipids, obviously, if the LDL is high, you do want to give them statins for sure. If you have ischemic heart disease and elevated LDL, you want to give them statin because it decreases the mortality by nearly 30%, right? So therefore you can, so if the indication is there, you could start statins at the time of discharge and we have seen no side effects. Um, there is a study that just uh, was presented at the American College of Cardiology where they use statins as a treatment for COVID. So um, they uh, have a prospective trial, uh, which was done out of Iran, actually, by physicians in the United States, uh, where they took two arms. One arm got anticoagulants and one arm got statins initiated, and they didn't find either of them help. But they did see in the subgroup analysis People who had ischemic syndrome, statins were clearly helpful and didn't harm the patient at all. So if at the time of discharge, you clearly identified the patient to have risk factors that required statin therapy, you shouldn't hesitate and go ahead and start statin therapy. Often what you find in the COVID world is many, many patients, and I'm sure this is happening in India, it happened in North America, South America and Western Europe, is many patients have diabetes and hypertension and never ever taken, um, seen a doctor and have gotten any care at all. 30% of the diabetics didn't even know they had diabetes. Same way, hypertension. They had hypertension for a while. They were never treated and COVID brought them to the hospital. And that's when we recognized it and started therapy. So if you see that, that at the time of admission, you have a hyperlipidemia, you want to use statins because they clearly will help the patient in the subsequent 90 days. Um, similarly, hypertension is something that you want to treat um, adequately, uh, just like you would treat a non-COVID patient. Um, number one, because it will also help you to decrease the progression of heart failure and coronary syndromes, number one. Number two, stroke, which I'll discuss in a little while later, um, is that there's an unusual type of strokes that you see in the post-acute phase, four to eight weeks, uh, four to 12 weeks, where you really want the hypertension to be well controlled, otherwise you end up with uh, uh, hemorrhagic strokes in them. Um, so once again, I, I kept in mind that India is under enormous pressure uh, in terms of health services, and you wouldn't be able to do labs easily. So in that situation, um, because if you use ARBs or, or diuretics, you will have to do electrolytes on them. So we, at this point, uh, if a patient doesn't want labs to be done or cannot get done as it is uh, easily, then we think the preferred drug of choice will be calcium channel blockers. Um, there's in vitro evidence showing that the MODP maybe has some... Yeah. Your microphone cuts in and out. Yeah. Uh, unplug and replug. I think um, that's because of the number of people logged in, I think. I, I can unplug it. Uh, okay. Can you okay. hear me now? Can now, you hear me now? We hear you well, but periodically okay. it cuts in and comes back. Yeah, it's happening even when you're talking. It's happening to all of us, I think. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll push through. And so amlodipine in vitro is slightly superior. There is some evidence that it is protective against COVID. Um, so two drugs that were tried uh, were amlodipine and verapamil. Both are uh, pretty good drugs. The drug I would avoid is nifedipine because many of the patients uh, with COVID have tachycardia. And so you may make it worse. So therefore I wouldn't use nifedipine. So calcium channel brackets are preferred. 
And the next, the fourth part of the cardiac uh, the dysfunction that I want to address is the issue of drug-induced cardiac toxicity. Um, I've heard um, it happened in the United States and we are beginning to see happening in, in India too. So many patients who have COVID get these combination of drugs. They get azithromycin. There's still lots of physicians who use hydrochloroquine. Remdesivir is often used. And agitation and uh, bizarre behavior, especially in the older, is very, very common in, uh, in COVID patients. So haloperidol and quetiapine is Office or Seroquel, I, I don't know what they call it in India, Kutaipin, are, are also being used. If you take the combination of these, all of these drugs will prolong your QT interval. Remdesivir actually causes bradycardia. So you're setting yourself for torsad and ventricular arrhythmia and sudden cardiac death. I can tell you there are any number of patients who have died um, uh, because. Um, they had drug-induced toxicity leading to ventricular arrhythmia and not because of the underlying heart disease that they have. So you really, especially with the elderly, you need to be careful of what medications you're using. Therefore, if they're not useful, something like azithromycin, you don't really want to use them anymore. And hydrochloroquine, one of them, it's particularly problematic because it stays in your tissues for two weeks. So even after you stop it, it still continues to have effects on your QT interval for another two weeks. So if you had given somebody hydrochloroquine and then added haloperidol or gave them quite a pain, particularly in the older patients, uh, you could expect to see sudden cardiac death. And I wouldn't be surprised that some patients died because of this combination of these drugs and has nothing to do with COVID or hypoxia or any form of heart disease. Okay. Again, uh, lights are stuck. Okay. Okay. Um, so the next one, uh, so that's about the heart failure and the importance of it. The next one is diabetes itself. So um, this is our data that we just uh, accepted for publication, but I want to just highlight a few things that are relevant for you too. Um, so this is our data of 12,100 12, patients in the first wave that we admitted. So we extracted as much information as we can, and obviously a substantial number of them had diabetes. Uh, but uh, the, the two things that I want to point out is there were patients who had known diabetes, um, and then there were patients who were pre-diabetic, and a third group of patients who were clearly not known to have diabetes by review of their medical records. We also had their um, uh, hemoglobin A1Cs before they got COVID, which were all normal, and at the the time of admission, they presented with severe DKA or severe hypoglycemia, even before steroids were given to them, uh, clearly indicating that COVID in some patients leads to new onset diabetes. And so we had at least 39 defined patients like that. And so the point I'm making is that knowing that patients have diabetes is one thing, uh, but you will see new onset diabetes in a, a certain percentage of patients. And a third group, they probably had diabetes, never saw medical, uh, never sought medical attention, and COVID will begin to unmask it, and they'll present as DKA or complicated other or hyperosmolar. That's how they present. So diabetes has a huge bearing on eventual outcome. So what, what happens if you take non-COVID patients and if you have sepsis, um, take septic shock patients admitted, not COVID, and then look at what happens to them when they have poor control of their glucose, especially serum glucose of more than 200, uh, nearly 50% of them will go on to develop cardiac dysfunction within the next six months, even if they survive septic shock and go home. So it's very important that, and then if you take COVID, it's a substantial 
um, cytokine uh, activation and substantial amount of uh, sepsi septic syndrome it causes, uh, even though it's viral mediated, um, uh, elevation in glucose in them uh, makes uh, heart failure even more likely to happen. So this is a very important aspect of care that uh, you don't want to uh, miss. So in our study, what we found was that the, the so non-diabetics, there was an extra mortality, pre-diabetics also did well, both, uh, but when we divided them into two age groups, um, those who are younger, below 55, and those who are older, uh, above 55. And if you ask, why did we come up with 55 and not 50? The CDC in the United States divides American population into, uh, based on our lifespans and our epidemiological data in the United States to 55 and below is considered younger and 55 and above is considered older. So that's why we use that. And what we found is diabetes in the younger group had substantially more mortality than diabetes in the older group. And so you are seeing that in India, that substantial number of your patients with COVID are younger and have diabetes with it. So their outcomes will be far worse. They're more likely to end up having severe heart disease. And so we need to think about what to do with them after discharge four weeks into it. So, um, so in our, um, just a Kaplan my plot showing that those who were newly diagnosed didn't do so badly. Those who had prior diabetes actually did worse. Um, so the newly diagnosed diabetics, uh, we followed them 90 days in. Uh, a third of them actually completely resolved their diabetes. A third of them still had it. And a third of them uh, started getting better, uh, but still required insulin for the treatment. So um, some remain diabetic at least until three months after discharge. So you will see new diabetics who will continue to become stay as diabetics going forward. So we need to figure out how to manage them. So basically you're looking at, in terms of diabetes, four different syndromes. You are unmasking pre-existing diabetes, the things you didn't know, and COVID will unmask it. There's some of them will go on to become diabetics. You will see stress hyperglycemia, obviously stress hyperglycemia, as well as that you're giving steroids to them. So it only makes matters worse. Once the stress is removed and steroids is removed, most should go back to normal glycemic states and they should do okay. And then of course you will have steroid induced hyperglycemia in patients who are prone to develop diabetes, you will probably, they'll end up becoming diabetic. Uh, in 2010, there was a study where they were trying uh, to do stress tests on patients to see who will develop diabetes. And the investigator at that time did eight milligrams of dexamethasone. And then he measured uh, the development of hyperglycemia, the insulin and the C-peptide responses and could fairly reliably predict who will become diabetics in future. Um, and that's exactly what you're doing to your patients. You're giving them six to 10 milligrams of dexamethasone. So you're stressing them. And if they develop profound hyperglycemia, you can expect some of them, especially those who are obese, um, who have metabolic syndromes, will end up with insulin resistance and diabetes going forward. And this uh, concept of nuanced diabetes in COVID-19, it's relatively new. Um, it, it still remains relatively uh, poorly understood We'll have to wait and see where this goes. We just have about three, four months of follow-ups on them. Uh, we'll wait and see what happens to them at the end of one year. So what is our, uh, our process um, on managing diabetics and what strategy do you want to use four weeks into um, um, having COVID? Firstly, the steroid-induced hypoglycemia can push people into DKA if they have underlying diabetes. Um, they can even end up in hyperosmolar too. So you really need to be careful when you're giving steroids to diabetics. Uh, the people who are more likely to get are, tend to be older. They tend to have obesity. If they're women, their previous history of gestational diabetes increases their risk. And if they had an abnormal glucose tolerance test, when you give steroids, it begins to show clearly. 
Um, and the important thing to remember, this is a subtlety uh, that you have to be aware, is that steroid-induced hyperglycemia primarily is postprandial. It creates postprandial insulin resistance. So when you're deciding um, to treat these patients with insulin, the glucose that you're going to really follow is based on which drug you're using, um, whether you're using... Um, um, whether you're using prednisone or methylprednisolone or dexamethasone. So if you're using prednisone, um, you want to decide when to give the medication um, and you want to fix it at a certain point in your day. It's 8 a.m. in the morning, everybody gets prednisone, that's fine. Or everybody gets dexamethasone. You really want a fixed regime because that will tell you when your hyperglycemic phase comes. So if it's prednisone, the peak happens four to six hours after you give your prednisone, and that will guide you on how much of insulin that you want to give. Because the one thing you don't want to have in, in post-COVID patients is a hypoglycemic shock. Why? Because if you have a patient who's hypoxic to begin with, who also now becomes uh, hypoglycemic, the amount of brain damage that they have and heart is very substantial. So you do not want to ever have hypoglycemia in, in patients in the post-acute phase of um, uh, COVID management. And it's fairly common because people are not paying attention to the steroids and how they influence uh, patients' uh, hyperglycemia. With dexamethasone, you don't see that peak that much, but it, most people, you will see it two hours after you give dexamethasone and then it stays high for nearly 24 hours or so. But you have to be careful that after an overnight fast, in the morning you will see a big dip in your glucose levels. So don't use that to determine, uh, use that to determine how much of glucose or insulin you wanna give the following day, but also use the postprandial glucose to decide uh, how much of insulin you want to give. And because of the underlying electrolytes and fluid balances that you can't really estimate accurately, uh, we prefer insulin as the only form of therapy. So we don't use oral hypoglycemics. We certainly won't use metformin. Um, everyone gets insulin. And how long depends on what we are dealing with. If a new onset person who gets better, once your steroids are down, obviously many of them will get better. Um, so then you may not have to use insulin. So you really want to um, have a game plan on what to do from four to 12 weeks uh, with their diabetes, because if that goes bad, uh, they'll end up with worse heart failure. So the way we want to prioritize is, based on our own study, we think younger people have to be seen more often than older people. Um, at the time of discharge, if you have a high hemoglobin A1C, the number we're using is 10, actually, which is fairly high. Um, and if you also have the presence of uncontrolled hypertension, um, those group of patients should be seen more often because you want to get the right kind of regime in them and have an adequate control of their glucose. And adequate control for us is just less than 200. We really don't shoot for tight control in the 90 days after COVID. So you don't need 120, it just has to be below 90, uh, sorry, below 200 and that's adequate. 90 days after that, you could decide what type of control you want. The last thing that you want to pay attention is, what is the understanding of the recognition of hypoglycemia? As I said, you must avoid hypoglycemic shocks at all, at all costs in these patients. So if you are doing this in, um, uh, to me, all patients are smart patients and smarter patients. Uh, they're smart because they came to see you uh, and smarter because they understand what hypoglycemia is. So if you end up with patients who can't understand what hypoglycemia are more prone to develop it, you may have to see them more frequently until they have a better understanding of how, to, how much of insulin to give or you have a better idea of what's the proper dose to give. Uh, so they, you really have to spend a little bit of time with your patients and ask them, can you recognize hypoglycemia or not? Uh, because if they recognize it and take some, whatever they can take to avoid it, that's good. But if you don't know what it is and end up with a hypoglycemic shock, 
you're probably harming the patient more than your help. And the last one I want to comment on is the stroke syndrome. And there's a two types of stroke syndromes that you see in acute COVID and post-COVID patients. The acute COVID ones are primarily happen in the hospital. This is data from 32 different countries, including Asia, 432 patients. So stroke is more common in men, no surprise there. But the problem here is nearly a quarter of them are less than 55 years. So younger patients getting stroke is a COVID unique uh, characteristic. And the second important thing that you will find is that they do get substantially more large vessel, uh, large vessel occlusions than normal stroke populations that you would do. If you do a comparison, this LVO is substantially high. We don't see this level in patients who have regular strokes, non-COVID related. So, but the other thing is, this is all in the first four weeks. Most of these stroke syndromes happen in the first four weeks. So they're primarily hospitalized. These patients are not admitted, um, not discharged uh, yet. So most of the issues that they have uh, are addressed. Um, they cause substantial mortality. So if you have an acute stroke, um, the, uh, a fair number of patients die during that admission itself. Um, and also um, there are, um, this is another study from uh, Europe, 160 patients where they looked at it and it kind of shows the same pattern both in all over the world as well as in the uh, United States. Um, what we are seeing is um, in the first four weeks, you will see large, well, large vessel occlusions, number one, a half of the patients who present with acute stroke. So in India now, because you have the pandemic raging, if you see acute stroke patient admitted with no COVID symptoms, you should think that it could be COVID and test them. I'm assuming everybody who's getting admitted to the hospital is being tested for COVID. So acute stroke syndrome may be a presentation, um, the form of presenting uh, patients as COVID syndrome without any respiratory disease at all or upper respiratory tract infection. In this trial, nearly 50% of them did not have any COVID syndrome. And once again, in this study from Europe, 10% uh, of them were below 50 years of age. So stroke is fairly common, causes substantial mortality, but um, that's all in during the admission. And I'm not worried uh, about that. I'm worried about what happens after the admission. Um, one other thing that this is experienced from the United States, um, acute stroke during the uh, both our first wave and the second wave, uh, nearly 1,100 patients. It was more common in Blacks and Asian population. As I said, it was more large vessel occlusion. But here's the problem with the management of it. It took longer time for them to come to the hospital. It took longer time for them to get a CAT scan done because people avoid COVID patients. And it took even longer time for us to get thrombolytic therapy. So therefore, all these reasons, um, they are doing worse off if they have COVID as compared to non-COVID patients. So if, um, you know, when you're overwhelmed, a lot of things get compromised and this would be one of them. Stroke care will get compromised. So therefore, when you didn't manage it adequately in the first four weeks, and then you stabilize and discharge them, they will collapse from stroke syndrome. So this is another reason why uh, people die. The third thing that you also have to remember with strokes is um, there are different kinds of strokes that happen from the fourth to the twelfth week. You begin to see minute deep infarcts. You will see both punctate hemorrhagic infarcts and you will also see uh, non-hemorrhagic infarcts. And they sometimes involve the limbic system. They can involve the usual cardiac lobes. Um, and so, and the lenticular stride uh, areas. So they're all over the place, number one. Number two, they tend to be multiple uh, between four to 12 weeks. They behave like embolic strokes. And we also see, um, you know, beating of the vessels indicating uh, severe endothelial inflammation in them. 
And so in this group of patients, the presentation of stroke would be bizarre behavior. So they don't get the classic stroke uh, symptoms. They get usually altered mental status. Uh, they are completely delirious. Um, they are acting out um, bizarre behavior and monoperesis or maybe just apraxia and nothing else or aphasia and nothing else. So very uh, focal symptoms. And often people can miss the stroke altogether and they go back and think this is still hypoxia causing it and go and treat hypoxia and forget this is, this is a stroke syndrome that they're missing. So four to 12 weeks, this is the problem that you will face in terms of strokes. And in them, if you go ahead and give anticoagulants without knowing what's in the brain, you may end up bleeding uh, in them. So in them also, we think statins may be of some value, uh, but we don't know enough what to do with them other than recognize them. So for a while, we thought that these are all neuropsychiatric syndromes that they're developing as post-traumatic syndromes. And indeed they do, and I'll come to that in a minute. But um, some of it is actually organic disease that they're developing post-COVID. And this is, we see more often in younger people uh, than older people, but we have seen this also happen in 60-year-olds and 70-year-olds. Um, so this is probably embolic and probably coming from the heart, but we don't know for sure, but we're seeing fair number of them uh, between four to 12 weeks. And this is something that you need to walk out, watch out for. And the last one I will start after this is this business about the neuropsychiatric syndromes. They're very, very common from four weeks onwards. Many patients will become develop uh, these syndromes and you have to pay attention to them. Because if they have on top of, let's say they develop major depression and also have an MI, that increases the mortality from the MI by 30%. Major depression with MI in non-COVID patient has a 30% higher death rate. So just imagine having that with COVID and major depression and acute MI, they're going to die substantially more. So you need to pay attention to the post um, acute phase, the 90 days upon discharge. One is the stroke syndromes that I told you. So if you're seeing the grandma, grandpa, and your parents getting very confused upon coming home, don't put them in a basket of post-traumatic stress syndrome. Think of all of them, that there may be stroke syndromes that you're missing first. And so that needs the best test for them in our view is MRI, but I can't say that's easily available in India at least you want to think about it, that it could be stroke and not something else. Um, the second thing is a, vast, a, a, a substantial number of patients, even with mild to moderate disease and more so of severe disease, will report impaired cognitive function. Um, they will say they, were, they can't remember things that well. Um, they have uh, struggled to find words, words that they always know, they block on it. I can't remember people's names. It's fairly common, 40% or so if they have severe illness, but 20% or so if they have mild to moderate illness. And this impaired executive function of which one of the frightening things that happens is this, um, you know, we all have irrational ideas come to our mind. Like I'm on the 11th floor. Um, and you, sometimes you might just look down and say, and wonder what would happen if I jump out of this from the 11th floor, right? And immediately we have ways to suppress that idea that this is a crazy idea and I don't want to do it. Uh, for some reason in the post COVID phase, these irrational ideas, they struggle to suppress them. So as a result, they tend to be um, um, impulsive. Um, they can commit suicide as a result of this. Um, and so it's not rare. And so you really have to pay attention to it. Uh, the most bizarre story was this father who had been discharged from the hospital and he would get this recurrent idea of wanting to strangulate his older child. And he's, he was so debilitated by it. Fortunately, he didn't strangulate his child, but he, he reported how often he would get this irrational idea to strangulate his child. So this sort of uh, symptoms are not rare and something you want to pay attention to it.
And of course, major depression is well reported and post-traumatic stress disorders are reported. I won't discuss in detail. Um, suicides have happened in substantial numbers. Uh, India always had a higher suicide rates in younger people. So just imagine if they're getting COVID, that rate will be will remain higher. And since they're all in lockdowns, all of that will only make, make matters worse for you. And the last group that I want to uh, um, emphasize is when people actually did studies on them, so they actually did questionnaires on patients who were discharged, one of the surprising things is we tend to focus on the patient only, um, but when they did the questionnaire to the, to the patient and the spouse or the caregiver, both had substantial um, cognitive and depression and stress disorders in them. So they don't just focus on just the patient, but also the caregiver, because they too would suffer quite uh, substantially in them. And then this business of survivor's guilt um, lead to major depression. Those who survive uh, feel bad about it. Um, and there's a whole uh, psychiatric syndromes that maybe uh, Dr. Hiram can get us, uh, the psychiatrist to address these issues. Um, but one of the ways I always describe in the first way, uh, COVID was a widow maker. And why I use that is uh, three is the one ratio, male versus female, uh, used to die. More men used to die than women. That was what happened in the United States in the first wave. And that's what happened in Asia too. And so I would describe um, COVID as a widow maker. It actually was a very useful uh, 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 way to describe it uh, to people who don't want to take vaccine. I find more men don't want to take vaccine and then they go convince their wife not to take the vaccine. So I always talk, I tell the patient, you know, COVID is a widow maker <laughs> and that kind of hits the point and they immediately start taking the vaccine. But in the second wave, it changed quite a bit. Uh, what happened in, in the first wave in United States, a household would have 20% attack rate. Um, in the second wave, when um, the, I think it's called now the beta, the alpha variant, um, then the attack rate went from 60 to 80% in the household which is what India has now. Somewhere between 60 to 80% of the household gets infected. So now, it's and then the rates of male is to female is caught up. It's no longer three is to one in, in your second wave. It was exactly what happened in the United States too. So now COVID kills off both of them and now you become an orphan. It's, uh, it's an orphan at home. You heard many stories where both parents died and they've left kids alone at home. So just imagine how those kids have to uh, manage with what we have to do. So all these, um, even though they are psychiatric syndromes, will have an impact on what happens at the time of discharge, four weeks to 90 days. So that's the uh, point I want to make. Uh, just to um, summarize again, and then we'll go into the discussion, pay particular attention to the heart, and control of diabetes and think about the stroke syndrome. We think they are the reasons why these three leading to one making the other worse, like poor control of diabetes, making heart disease worse. We think is the main reason why patients die between four weeks and 90 days. So with that, um, I'll, I'll stop um, and uh, we'll uh, take questions and uh, discuss it. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing um, um, the slides and uh, we'll go through the questions. Uh, Kairam, you have questions. Um, so I'll ask, uh, I can read the first question. What's your reason for not indicating aspirin in post-coronary syndromes? Um, and if so, how long? And so I, I don't, uh, I do want people to get aspirin and uh, clopidogrel. I, I'm not saying don't get it. Uh, what I'm saying is if you already have, let's say a pulmonary embolism uh, with COVID and at the time of, and also have ischemic heart disease, um, now you have to give them an anticoagulant for the PE, aspirin and clopidogrel. We have data showing when you do three drugs, your more chances of bleeding 
and get yourself into a sticky situation. So um, since increasingly the data is showing that aspirin is really not that useful as we thought it is, uh, and it was clopidogrel that matters more than anything else. So we just dropped in aspirin, hoping that we would decrease the rate of bleeding at least somewhat, if not substantial. Uh, we don't have data showing that it's better. Um, we just want to decrease as much um, uh, chances of bleeding as we can. That's what uh, the reason why I said drop aspirin if you want to. Um, and if I drop it, I'll drop it as long as I have to give the anticoagulant. Uh, typically be giving for proven P somewhere between three months to six months. Uh, if it's uh, if we know why they have PE. Um, so if it's, we don't know then why they got PE, then that's a different issue. But we know in these patients, it's COVID causing it. Uh, typically three to six months of proven DVD is enough. After that, you don't need to. So at that point, stop the anticoagulant and start back on aspirin and uh, clodip clopidogrel assuming your patient has coronary artery disease. Yeah. Uh, you're muted, uh, Ram. Can you, you're muted. Uh, yes, yeah, um, I'm, I'm reading a question from Dr. Raju uh, regarding tachycardia. Yeah. Should we be using amlodipine? You... Yeah. I think you can use it. Um, there's no problem uh, using amlodipine. Um, but make sure, so what uh, you have two drugs to pick from. Um, if the patient didn't have high blood pressure, substantial high blood pressure, didn't have diabetes, um, or let me put it this way, if there's no real uh, contraindications to give beta blockers, we prefer beta blockers for that tachycardia. We, we've used it with, um, and we only had to use it for a month and it, the tachycardia would go away and we would stop beta blockers. Um, but there were others who used uh, amlodipine, even I've used amlodipine with similar benefit. So I think you can use amlodipine uh, to manage tachycardia. Just use five milligrams, don't go to 10 before all you're treating is tachycardia. But at the same time, um, make sure you're not missing something else. You know, the tachycardia is, uh, uh, could be P, could be something else too. So always think about it before you just treat uh, tachycardia for the sake of tachycardia. Dr. Pilla has a question. She would ask herself. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Dr. Chilimori, hands down, best lecture. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And my question is, my brother is a 60-year-old diabetic. He is fully vaccinated, however, had a moderate disease. He recovered. So what is the follow-up? How soon should he go? And how do we know what part of his body is being affected? Because you yeah. said heart and yeah. uh, nervous system, all that, like where yeah. should he go? So the most important thing in him I would do is get an echocardiogram. You must get one because I think the main um, target organ in all these patients will be the heart. Um, in fact, two days ago, I think some uh, uh, we were presented with a gentleman who had multiple myeloma. Uh, I think uh, if I recall had diabetes um, and had mild COVID and we were discussing about the anticoagulants in that person. For me, that patient and your brother should get an echo more than anything else. And that will give, give us guidance on what to do next. If the echo is normal, uh, then all we have to do is focus on controlling his diabetes uh, with the understanding that his diabetes may actually get worse in the beginning and then get better nine, three months from now. So I think the next three months, I would watch his hemoglobin A1Cs and at least make sure his glucose is not exceeding 200 at any time. Um, after that, uh, 90 days beyond, I, to be honest, I really don't know what would happen to them, but um, the heart disease is the most important thing I would worry about. So he should get an echo now. Um, I'm assuming that he has the capabilities to get it. And that would be absolutely the, the only thing I would focus on in here. Uh, so uh, which antihypertensives are contraindicated, which would you not use? Yeah, so there are none uh, contraindicated um, currently. Initially, we were concerned about uh, ACE inhibitors. So there are no contraindications now for any of them. But just be aware that post-COVID, if you give 
uh, ACE or ARB, um, because a fair number of them will have renal failure and a fair number of them will get hyponatremia because they develop SIDH from their pneumonias. Um, so hyponatremia is fairly common in them. Um, so if you don't have labs on them, um, you try any of those antihypertensives, uh, you'll run into trouble. That's why we say use calcium channel blockers. But on the other hand, if you have labs and you can check his renal function, you can check the electrolytes, then use uh, any antihypertensives, you'll be fine. You can use even low-dose uh, diuretic with uh, with uh, his combination and that would be fine, but only if you know the electrolytes. But I'm assuming in lots of Indians, that's not easily available. That's why for use uh, calcium channel blockers for now. Did you have a word of caution against nifedipine? The only reason why I tell don't use nifedipine because it causes tachycardia. And a fair number of post-COVID patients have tachycardia and then you'll get confused if the medication is giving it or uh, the disease is giving it, you, you want to know. So that's why you don't want to use nifedipine. Dr. Melissa Rao asked some very good questions nowadays. He's, uh, I think he's got a trick in front of us. Is there any relationship between the use of statins in diabetics and mucormycosis? Dr. Melissa Rao, is that what you meant? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, not that we know of, um, again, in the non-COVID, We've never seen statins have any bearing on uh, development of carmicosis. Um, and we have not seen it. Um, I, we looked at the cases in Wysag, uh, the best of my knowledge, they were not on statins and still developed my new Um Again, the, uh, the, the, the thing with statins, if a patient is already on it uh, before they got COVID, I think they're fine continuing with statins, except of course, COVID will give you abnormal liver function tests. And in that instance, you may have to stop the statin. But if the LFTs are normal, we have no data showing that statins are in any way harmful. By and large, they probably are helpful because the endothelial activation is substantial in COVID. Uh, we've done CATs on patients after COVID. And you can see, what you see is the, the cardiac angiogram shows very delayed emptying of contrast to the angiogram, suggesting um, almost like a smoker, somebody who smokes for 30 years, 30 pack years of smoking, you will find them that the dye the contrast kind of empties out very sluggishly, indicating the very high levels of endothelial activation. In post-COVID, we've seen that. And we've treated them primarily with statins and aspirin and clopidogrel. And then three months later, um, if the patient was completely normal, they compromised LV function, became better and nearly normal. And we asked them to continue to take statins if their LDLs are all low. But if they're all normal, then we give them an option to stop it. If everything else being normal, meaning they're not diabetic, not hypertensive, then we are comfortable stopping the statins after that. Um, but I think uh, uh, no evidence that they are harmful. My doubt is, uh, my I, I read somewhere that uh, statins, uh, the incidence of mucor is less in uh, people are uh, taking statins in diabetes. Yeah, um, I think statins uh, as a whole are helpful because they kind of not allow endothelial uh, activation to the extent that COVID does that. That's the reason why the trials were done to see if statins uh, per se, just give it to people whether they have high LDL or not and see if they protect you from COVID. That evidence didn't exist. I, I think currently you should only give if there's an indication to give statin. So if your LDL is high, give statin. If not, don't give it for the sake of giving it. Um, so that's why if there's a clear indication, give it, otherwise wait. Um, so if the diabetic did better with, on statin, that's useful information going forward. So that, that uh, the, the way I would use it, so I would go search for LDL uh, before a patient goes out. And if it's high, I would give statins. So I would have a low threshold to give statins. When Dr. Prem Kumar posts a question in the chat box, I always ask him to ask yourself, Prem. 
So um, would glyphosin be a better choice to have cardiac benefits? Um, in the non-COVID world, yes, uh, but this data doesn't exist in the COVID world, so I don't want to answer it, number one. Um, and um, I don't know how readily available they are in India, so uh, um, technically they should work, but uh, we don't have any evidence, so I, I, I don't want to recommend them at this point. But the best drug is uh, to use um, insulin. Do stress uh, myocarditis happen? It's, it definitely happens. Um, so this is the reason why uh, pay a lot of attention to heart disease uh, after your four weeks of COVID, after you've taken care of pneumonia, the hypoxia, um, please, the major attention should be on the heart. So we do see Takasubos fairly regularly. I think we've seen five cases. Um, in, in fact, we had a patient um, who uh, was doing fine, discharged home, went home, found her husband dead of COVID and she collapsed and she had Takasubos from, from the news that her husband died. Um, so it's, it's, it's uh, not uncommon and it should be thought of every time uh, because they're under enormous stress uh, anyway. So yes, it's uh, seen in patients uh, post COVID. Thank you. Um, Dr. Fernandez, you might have some questions. Uh, your speaker, microphone. No, sir. Today I'm not having any questions. Okay. Sir. Thank you. Okay. So um, we'll go to Dr. Nandial's question. Um, the treatment. Um, so the brother in law in mid 70s living in Hyderabad, type 2 diabetic, not a smoker, normal BMI, was treated for chemotherapy two months back for follicular lymphoma and waiting for second dose of vaccine. Please observe, advise what I need to communicate. Um, once again, because uh, chemotherapy itself is a risk factor uh, that uh, worsens heart disease. Firstly, it causes cardiomyopathy itself, depending on what type of chemotherapy they gave. Um, and it's always considered as risk factor. And now that um, uh, if he had COVID, I'm not sure if the, your brother-in-law had COVID. Um, if he didn't have COVID, obviously we want him to be vaccinated. And so um, the timing of the second dose of vaccine. So uh, we've been studying vaccine failures in patients with COVID. Um, so uh, we wrote two case reports already, one with uh, eclusimab and another one with rituximab, um, where patients got vaccines and did not develop antibodies um, and actually subsequently got infected. Um, so the way you want to time the doses uh, as far as away from the chemotherapy, so they, I, I, I would, I can, uh, maybe Dr. Budraj can comment on it. The chemotherapy for lymphoma, I'm assuming, will deplete all his uh, lymphocytes uh, altogether, I'm assuming. Um, and so if they can tell us when they will rebound back, that would be the time I would give the second dose of the vaccine. So Dr. Budraj, when do you think after chemotherapy, your lymphocyte counts bounce back. So most of the follicular lymphomas are B-cell lymphomas and almost all of them will get rituximab. Uh, typically, it's anywhere between four to six cycles. They would get four to six uh, doses of rituximab. That wipes out the entire B-cell population. Um, and, uh, you know, they take several months. In fact, when we use prophylaxis, uh, uh, with antibiotics, um, um, we use them for at least six months in a lot of these cases. Now, there's data emerging now with um, the vaccines that people who are getting rituximab, anti-B cell therapies, and also um, in uh, uh, rheumatology practices where they're using a lot of immunosuppressants and anti-B cell therapies and anti-TNF therapies, that the, vac the vaccines... Uh, are not mounting antibody response, sometimes uh, even zero, nothing. And so there's now talk about uh, by WHO or CDC, I think to um, even consider doing a third dose of the vaccine. Um, I, I just heard that from somebody from CDC recently. There's no guidelines yet, but I have a suspicion that they're gonna advise probably another dose, like a third dose a few months after 
the second dose. So for this patient, uh, I would uh, you know stretch the vaccine to as far back as possible from the B anti B cell therapy, which I would think three to six months. I would be very very careful because these are the ones that are failing vaccines. Um, so it would be very important. So we just Thank published you. a case report with uh, rituximab. So that's what happened to the patient. Um, he got both doses, but uh, unfortunately timed the uh, so vaccines around rituximab and the vaccine didn't work. Um, so in your brother-in-law, so I hope he won't get uh, COVID, but if he were to get, um, what we did with our patient, once he got infected on day one or day two, I gave uh, monoclonal antibodies and he had a bear, and within two days he was fine, and he did eventually well. Um, by the way, um, he still didn't get antibodies uh, a month after infection. He still did not have him, so he survived um, because of the monoclonal antibodies, which are now available in India. So if he were to get infected, I would immediately give it to him, even if he's uh, gotten the vaccine. If he gets infected the optimal treatment would be, in his case, monoclonal antibodies um, because they work. And then at least it will protect him for the next 90 days. Um, so hopefully, um, as Dr. Budraj said, we will have better information on whether to give third dose or a different kind of vaccine and see if that helps. Uh, that's the other trial. They're trying to mix vaccines to see if they get a, a better response. So I, I would be very careful with Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Shilmuri. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, Dr. Pilla has another question. Yeah. Uh, this is an extension with, uh, to the previous question, Dr. Chilmuri. I have my father and his brothers, his parents, everybody died in early 60s due to massive heart attacks. So my brother, other brother who lives in United States started having some bradycardia he went to the cardiologist and they did an echocardiogram and said everything is fine. However, uh, last year he went for an angiogram himself. He just went for an angiogram in India and he was found to have six blocks. Eventually yeah. he came back and got stents placed in Methodist here. Yeah. So my, my elder brother, I'm, I'm confused. If he gets an echocardiogram and they say, okay, everything is fine. Is that all or should he go for an angiogram? He shouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't do an angiogram. I think if you think there's a risk based on the family history and that he's a diabetic, maybe a stress test is the, probably the right way to go. A stress echo or a stress thallium would be a better test and not go directly for an angiogram because um, firstly, um, there's a risk of renal failure because you're giving contrast to a person with diabetes. So why would you uh, want to uh, incur renal failure in a diabetic? Uh, because eventually they will develop it. So you want to postpone it as much as possible. So I would do a stress test in him before I subject him for an um, a angiogram. See, that there is something you said today that produced a scare in me for the future. You use the word diabetogenicity. Yeah. That is COVID itself could cause diabetes in the future. I just want you to remind me, one of your predecessors in the neighborhood at Misericordia, wasn't there a chairman of medicine who studied hepatitis or one of the infections as a reason for pancreatic stones, pancreatic disease with a high prevalence of diabetes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm intrigued by this business that you see large numbers of COVID patients, many of them previously not known to be diabetics, found to have diabetes during the acute illness. And now you're suggesting maybe this darn virus itself is diabetogenic. So we have so the, Yeah, so what we think happens, so there's enormous amount of ACE receptors in the pancreas. Um, so they clearly, the virus, is trophic to the GI tract. In the GI tract, it actually, you get a fair amount of it in the pancreas. That's known now. Um, we, um, we routinely do lipase levels on patients uh, who are admitted, uh, admitted patients, not mild disease, moderate severe illness, and a fair number of them will have elevated lipase. In, in 
indicating that it could be multifactorial. It could be the virus um, causing damage to the pancreas or because they are toxic, they may be ischemic damage to the pancreas, one of them. Um, but it being trophic to the pancreas is now well established. Whether it destroys islet cells directly through viral uh, infection itself, uh, or whether it causes T cell activation, which go and destroy islet cells, um, and or um, if you have a propensity to develop diabetes, you already have activated T cells and COVID comes along and potentiates those CD8 cells to attack your islet cells. And that's how you develop diabetes. That's the uh, hypothesis why COVID actually brings out diabetes or causes diabetes in patients. Yeah, well, we've seen it. We've seen a fair number of patients first time coming to hospital with DKA with absolutely no history of diabetes in the past. Um, so we've seen that, and, and many people in India have seen it too. So um, how it, we'd like to know more about it, um, um, uh, but so far, this is all we know. One of your early slides today had a relatively large sample, something like 4,000 patients studied uh, post-COVID. Uh, yeah. what, what was said about diabetes in that? So we are the first to publish something. I think um, not much is said on that. So um, that's the reason why our paper got accepted for publication fairly quickly. There's not enough data. That's where we are. I think we are helping contribute that data. Um, but what we know um, based on um, our experience and, and few others is that diabetes gets worse than 30% of that. If you already are diabetic, um, but some of it is because they took steroids. Remember that, that, that contributes to the worsening of the disease. Um, so once um, um, that steroids is off, how many continue to have bad diabetes? We think a third. So they uh, clearly need to watch. Okay. Dr. Sudhakar, uh, I see one more message in the chat box. Dr. Raju says some labs in Vishakhapatnam are doing spike protein antibodies test. Do they really indicate immune response to the vaccine? Yeah, they do. Um, so um, if, when you get vaccine, this is the antibody test that you want to do. You want to do spike protein antibody test. Um, the test so far that uh, at least three different versions of it in the United States, they fairly have high levels of specificity and uh, sensitivity. So yeah, they do measure antibodies. What we don't know is the, what is the titer where you get adequate response is not known. Um, so the lab will give you a number where it says it's positive. And so there will be some with a titer of 250 and another titer of 5,000, another person. Uh, so we don't know it's 250 person less immune versus 5,000 patient. That part is not known, but spike protein uh, positivity tends to uh, go in favor of having immunity against the virus. Well, 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 thank you very much. Thank you very much. As I said in the beginning, you are one heck of an all-rounder. Keep playing cricket for us. Dr. Sudhakar, he's yours. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, wonderful session we had. Uh, it's a very good one. And uh, I think it is long overdue. Number two, I think we have to have this session again because uh, the problems, long-term problems after COVID are not going to die down and more and more information is going to come. So I think we should have, uh, maybe after about three or, three or four weeks, we should have one more session uh, with the latest data that is uh, available. Uh, thank you, Sridhar, for your uh, very, uh, you know, a scholarly presentation and uh, uh, the, data, the data, data yes. that has been given. Uh, wonderful it is. And uh, we look forward for more such sessions from you. Uh, thank you all. Uh, over, to, over, to, uh, over to Dr. Kairam. Uh, Naveen, 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 please mute your phone. Naveen, please mute your phone. Naveen.
Uh, many of you would remember that uh, Pratit Kulkarni, he gave a wonderful talk on drugs and infectious diseases talk. I asked him to come back tomorrow. We'll be back again tomorrow at the same time. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Sridhar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. No, I love it.